So I grew up in San Antonio and then uh, spent some time in, in Fort Worth, but my, uh, my early years were in San Antonio. I lived only about four blocks I lived just a block off of, some of y'all know San Antonio, I lived a block off of um, Broadway Street, a block and a half off of that, just right off the corner of New Braunfels. And, and um, I was maybe four, five, six blocks at the most away from the, from the San Antonio Zoo. And what was, what was always interesting was if the wind was just right and it came out of the south and the west just a little bit, then at night when my brother and I slept in the front bedroom, we could hear lions roaring, which always was fascinating to me, to live not far from lions in the city. And, um, and, and then, of course, San Antonio had all these other wonderful... I mean, you'd hear other animals too, but that was the lions at night that just sort of woke you up in the middle of the night, and it was such a fascinating thing. But we also had the fiesta, you know, and we had tall buildings, and we had all this diversity of, of, of people in, in the heart of the city, and we were just about a, a half a mile north of the, of the downtown area. Um, and then my mother said she was moving us to Fort Worth, And I'd been to Fort Worth, but all I remember about Fort Worth was that my grandfather, who was a surgeon here, was also a farmer and a rancher on the side. He grew up farming and ranching as a kid, and so he loved that. And so all I remember is that when we came to visit him, we'd go to the farm. We went out to his ranch up in Atoka, but we'd go to a little lease where we'd get out there. And most of the time as kids, we had to work. We put up fences that got torn down, or or we got hay and and, uh, put it out for feed and such. So it, it was... So it was a different reality altogether. All I remember about the wildness of San Antonio was that there were these tall buildings and this diverse population and lions. And then all I remember about Fort Worth as a kid that there were cattle and manure and hay, even though there was this town. So that even when we did finally move here and we moved over just in the west side, that we spent a lot of time at the stockyards because on weekends, my grandfather would drive up to his ranch in Atoka and he would grab some cattle, come down, and he would sit at the arena, the old arena that was in, in the stockyards, and he would bid on cattle. And then we would ride back with him. I remember when he took me to the ranch once and I remember thinking it was forever. It took like days to get to Atoka. Right? As a kid, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have smartphones, we didn't have electronic games or iPods or anything. We just stared out at the pasture, you know, as we're driving along. And sometimes if our imagination was good enough, we could sort of think up things and realities, or then we'd, we'd, we'd play the game, does this hurt more or less in the back seat, you know? <laughs> which, which, you know, usually you would win, right? It was like, you see how close you can get. Now you hit me, and then you go like, oh, I'm sorry, I lose. And then I would whack my brother. And so, so we did that. But my grandfather would turn around as we're driving up to Atoka, and he would say, as we got further and further out, you know, you could smell things. And he'd say, don't you just love it? I love the smell of dirt. And I would think, all I smell is cow manure, right, or hay or the fields and stuff, and, and, so, and then we got there, and all I remember bringing back was burrs and stickers and watching out for rattlesnakes, and, and so I didn't have these great memories of this outdoors, this wilderness that he loved so much, but what I did begin to notice, because he would take us to church, we didn't go to church a lot as kids, y'all don't remember that about my background, but we went to UCC every now and then, Uni- University Christian Church, because that's where they were members, and they would take us every now and then, and otherwise, Sunday was kind of a day off, my mom works six days a week, and so we would, Sunday was our day to sort of rest with her, and we would do different things, but on the Sundays we would go to church, I remember thinking about after having seen my grandfather at church, and having seen my grandfather on the farm, and thinking to myself, he he has, and I didn't know how to word it then, I didn't know how to word it, but this is what I was thinking, he is more at peace with himself, he is more genuine with himself, he is more experiencing a sense of love out in the pasture or when he's doing his surgery. And my grandfather was incredibly generous. He, was, he, he got lots of awards from the uh, railroad company because he did a lot of work on, railroad, on the railroad workers, a lot of free surgery and medical care, and he did a lot of work on the south side of Fort Worth where he had his office. And so he was generous with both things. He was generous with his ranching and farming. He was generous with his surgery. But that's where he felt most at home. And it always struck me as odd. It made me think, okay, that's where God is, right? God's in the church, And then the church people come out and sort of disperse a little bit of God here and there, right? And do a few little gaudy things and then go back to get regenerated with God. And then out in the farm and out in the country and in the wild of the fiesta, that's where all the heathens are. You know, that's where the wilderness is. 
And then we had this interesting story. Jesus went into the wilderness. And where did Jesus send the disciples after they all, you know, after at the end when he was great commission? He didn't say, now get back to the synagogues. He said, go out. Get out there and go amongst people. I don't think my grandfather knew what he was thinking at the time. I don't think he really pegged it because, you know, for years and years and years and centuries and centuries and centuries, we pretty much understood God thanks to Constantine and Constantinople and the Council of Nicaea and to the inst institutionalization of, of churches and any kind of reality gets institutionalized after a while, right? It becomes this sort of power structure, which is interesting. That's what the Garden of Eden story is really all about, right? The Garden of Eden story really is about power. I want to seek power. God's saying, that's not what this is about. And Adam and Eve are like, sure, it tastes good. I'm going to do that because that's who humans are. That's who we are. We like to objectify things. We like to dominate things. I don't think my grandfather had put this together because he grew up in, a, in the reality of Christianity, which for centuries had seen God and creation, creator and creation, as very separate entities that had begun to distance that relationship that I'm thinking, and I want to suggest to you, was never separate in the beginning. So when, when the first... Folks came over here, the first settler, European settlers came over here, and the indigenous people were already here. They found that there was a worship that was taking place that was kind of like this. It was animistic. You know, it was like everything is, Im is embedded with the, with, the, with the great spirit. But there's a theological word for that called pan... Oops. No. Pantheism. I'm going to give you a theology class here today. Pantheism, which means... God is all and all is God. God is the tree and the tree is God. God is the rock and the rock is God. God is those animals and those animals are God. So it's this idea that God are the objects. Now that's been true for a lot of religions over the years. Again, it's pretty natural for us to try to objectify what we don't understand so that we can grasp some control of it. But there's another sense in which I think this story is speaking to and that Jesus was speaking to when he says, the kingdom is among you. It's already happening. Every time that the prophets came and spoke to the people of Judaism and Jesus to the people of Judaism, it was always about you forgot the connection. It was always you forgot, just look at the injustice. Just look at the hatred. Just look at the violence. Just look at the greed. You forgot the connection. What does God require but to love the Lord with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself, to walk humbly with this great creation and mystery and creator in our midst? But that's not what was happening. What was happening was this sense of control again. So we have this idea of pantheism. Now, Theism, of course, is this idea that God is completely removed, that God is sort of like super, Superman, sort of super being. God is the omnipotent, all-knowing, all-wise. God's the better me. Right? That's, that's, that's kind of black and white. Kind of, I'm, I'm making a little bit of a bold statement here. I want you to stay with me here. That we have this tendency to want to project ourselves on what we don't know. And so we end up making God basically a better us. And we miss the point again. Because that's what our egos do. That's what our conscience does. We, we try to objectify, to create this sense of control. So here's what is another way of thinking about it. That I think my grandfather would have said, if you could have pegged him. And my grandfather was a smart guy. But he didn't, understand, he didn't know theology. There's this other understanding of theology called panentheism. Pantheism, panentheism. You want to try to say that with me? Panentheism. Don't worry, you're not going to hell for saying that word. It's, it's a good word, panentheism. But what it means is God is not the tree. God is in the tree and with the tree, and the tree is in God and with God. 
The universe is not God, but the universe is with God and in God, and God is in the universe and with the universe, so that when creation happens, it is of God's substance. Now, you're going to say, well, that sounds to me like it's the Big Bang. I mean, isn't that basically what science is saying? It's the Big Bang, and then everything kind of comes about, and isn't that just basic universe and science? And, and I'm going like, isn't that basic theology and mystery? And can't that also be God, right? But we have this tendency to want to objectify. So we no longer live in the mystery. We try to control the mystery. And we no longer relate. We try to control the relationship. And that's where we get into trouble. And that's where we stop relating to people. And that's when things start really falling apart in our world. And they fall apart in big ways. This idea of panentheism, another way to put it is a guy named, by the name of Peter Rollins. You can check him out if you want to. He's an interesting guy. I like him because he's from Northern Ireland and he's just fun to listen to. Uh, he's also a little complicated to listen to to try to understand what he's saying. But um, he's a theologian and philosopher. And one of the things, he gives this wonderful illustration. He says, imagine that you're a ship at, in the ocean, at the bottom of the ocean, and you're a passenger on that ship, but you can breathe, you're underwater, but you can breathe. He said, God is in that ship and in that person on that ship. That person has some substance of God. That ship has some substance of God, but God is bigger than that ship too. But yet that ship also, God also has some aspect of that ship in God. Does that make sense? So that there's an interrelationship with God. So I want to think with you a little bit real quickly about this idea of soil and dirt and our relationship with soil. Because my grandfather would say this. He would say, he would often say this, Tommy, there are three things on the farm, in the farm that are important. And I always thought this was interesting. He said, the farmer, right? The land, and then the spirit of the land. Now, I don't know that my grandfather knew what he was talking about when he talked about the spirit of the land, but he would often say the land calls him. The land just calls to him. The way that maybe when you're most genuine with yourself, you feel this deep sense of calling about who you are and what you're doing, the way you feel connected deeply. The way when something happens and you reach out to somebody and all of a sudden you feel this bond that you didn't think was possible because you'd already made up your mind about who that other person might be or was, and so now you didn't have that chance. But once you do open up, it's as if something had called to you, right? That spirit of the land. Well, if you look up the words Adam, the Hebrew of Adam is interesting. You know what it means? It means soil or red soil, red earth. If you look up the word Eve, the Hebrew of Eve, which is, I think it's pronounced ham, hamma, or hamma, it means life. God planted life and soil together in the garden. I love this image. I imagine God walking through the garden, looking for Adam and Eve, and as God's walking along, he's stepping in stuff, you know, he's dodging burrs. I don't think of creation as being this, I mean, of the garden as being this glowy thing and God's walking through in a white robe and it never gets stained. I imagine God being more like this. These are Doxy's boots. <laughs> I asked her to bring him in. Where's Doxy? Doxy, do you love your job? <laughs> Doxy works in the mud. <laughs> so I asked her to bring these boots in. I imagine God being more like that. I imagine God being connected, being deeply rooted, getting stuck in it. And then instead of sort of enjoying and living in the midst of the soil, Adam and Eve, the proto-human crisis, try to control things. And the minute they begin to try to control things, that's when they start to lose their grip of where they are. And that's the challenge for us as we think about what it means to be grounded in God, to find God in the world. I think that's what it means to experience this sense of we are in God and God is in us. And the only way to cultivate that 
is in our relationships, but not just our relationships here because that, again, begins to get so anthropomorphic. It becomes so focused on us being the crowning achievement of God's creation, we forget that viruses are a whole lot more powerful. We forget that there's all sorts of bacteria that we walk upon every day, that when I was driving from Tucumcari on my way back from Colorado a couple of week, about a week ago, Lynn and I just pulled off the side of the road because I made the mistake of looking through the sunroof and it was about 10 o'clock at night, and I thought, something's on up there. I don't know what that is, and I pulled off the side of the road, and the sky was just brilliant with this carpet of stars. I'd forgotten how brilliant the sky is that we forget that we live in the midst of this strange, mysterious creation. But what I'd forgotten at that moment as I was looking up and marveling at the Milky Way and seeing all these stars that I suddenly had sort of lost my bearing for just a moment was that I stand on soil that is rich with trillions of different kinds of bacteria and molecular and submolecular structures that create the possibility for life. That if we're not careful, we end up trying to dominate and control, and eventually we lose the garden. And I think that's where we are. And I think that's where we have to remember to get back in touch. We have to get back in touch with creation itself to be more present to God. It's a lot easier to just go about our lives and to think, I'm just going to think about God every now and then. And maybe on Sundays, you know, I'll come and get, I'll kind of get the jolt. But, um, and maybe I'll sort of rely on my beliefs because I've, I've objectified them and they're my banner. And as long as I hold this banner and as long as you agree with this banner, then we're going to be okay. But if I put all that aside and open up, I suddenly find out there's something calling to me. So this week, or this last week, Linda and I were doing laundry at the laundromat. And we were on Vickery Street. Some of you know the Vickery Cafe. We were having breakfast at the Vickery Cafe. We were down the street making, doing our laundry, and we had like four or five loads of laundry. And sometimes our, our reason was because our dryer was broken, so we were there. But sometimes we just go there because you can get a lot of laundry done at one time, <laughs> right? You just walk in with bag loads of laundry, and they're going like, there's just two of you. What's the matter with you people? Like, we change five times a day. Every day is a performance. The McDermott stage. And so, but we have all this stuff. We brought it all in, and we're sitting there, and there's this crowd gathered all around us, right? And so um, as we're sitting there doing the laundry, these kids are running around, and there's this one kid and this one young mom, and she's just devastated. She's overwhelmed. She's totally whipped. And this little four-year-old's getting the best of her right and left. And he's in everybody else's stuff, and she's apologizing right and left and smiling, you know, sort of uh, in, in humility. And if the, ba if the child was old enough and he was tall enough, he probably would have opened up and crawled into the dryers. But as it was, he was able to push that door open. Whenever she turned her back to do the laundry, he pushed the front glass door open and he was out and gone, right? He was headed down the sidewalk and she would be out. She'd look crazy. And finally, different people were going like, he is out the door again. Can't you control your child? And, and, and so she was running down. Well, Linda was coming back. I was doing some of the folding. She was coming back from, the, from finishing her breakfast and ran into the little, child, little boy. And so she knelt down. You know, it's, it's wonderful being a grandparent. You remember all of that again. And she knelt down, and she was, you know, smiling and kind of preoccupying him until mom showed up. And she was almost in tears. I mean, this woman was really overwhelmed. And, and she said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so And Linda said, you know what? This is a kid. Kids do this. Kids are out and looking at the world. Everything is opportunity. Everything is possibility. And Linda smiled and said, you're doing a good job. You're doing a great job. You don't need to apologize. Don't worry. It's hard being a parent. And the, and the woman just almost got kind of teary-eyed. And she, she said, thank you so much. And she hugged Linda. And then Linda gave her a card and said, I'm at First United Methodist Church. I want you to come down and join the church. You can experience God's love right down here at the church. Come on down. You can experience it. I laughed with her about that. I said, why didn't you give her a card? You know, she was like, you know what, Tom? She said, I just, we, when we talked about driving home, we said, church happened. It just happened. Jesus was just revealed. God's love was just revealed, and it was a total accident, but all it required was being open to the moment and looking for relationship. 
and how little we do that, how, how hard it is for us to do that in our workplaces. It happens that the, gro the grocery clerk looks at me and says, oh, my life is, is a wreck. And I go, oh, I'm so sorry to hear about that. You have a good day now. And, you know, and we, just, we just walk off, right? We, or we make small talk. But right behind that small talk is the soil of the earth going like there's all sorts of possibilities. But right now things are a little broken and we need to open it up. We need to open up the soil to cultivate it. So this week, I encourage you to sort of spend some time with that, to begin to get back in touch with the earth a little bit. Maybe put your ear. I'm going to invite the band to come up here. They're going to play as we have communion. And, and I want to read a poem before we finish, just a short poem by Mary Oliver. It's one of my favorite poems. And, um, and then we'll have communion. And we'll be doing communion by intention, as you know. And there'll be two stations up here, and actually there'll be a third station over here, so we'll try to expedite this without being too rushed. But this is a beautiful poem by Mary Oliver. This is what I encourage you to go do this week. All this season, all this series, we're going to be talking about earth. We're going to talk about air. We're going to talk about water. We're going to talk about community and neighborhoods. And we're going to talk about what brings creation together. The God of dirt came up to me many times and said so many wise and delectable things. I lay on the grass listening to his dog voice, his crow voice, frog voice. Now, he said, now, and now, and never once mentioned forever. <laughs> 